We have here the case of San Fernando, Coca-Cola, Rank and File Union versus Coca-Cola, Butler's Philippines Inc., which deals with principles on unfair labor practice and the assumption order issued by the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment. The employer here found a need to improve its selling and distribution system if it wanted to remain viable and competitive in the business. Thus, it decided to implement a new cost-effective and simplified scheme of selling and distributing its products. That, in turn, led to the separation of 27 rank-and-file regular employees and union members on the ground of redundancy. The employer claimed that prior to the termination of employment, it had made a careful study of how to be more cost-effective in operations and competitive in the business. It recognized in the process that its multi-layered selling and distribution system had to be simplified. Thus, it determined that the phasing out of said system was necessary, which however resulted in the termination of employment of certain employees as their positions have become redundant. On May 29, 2009, the employer issued notices of termination to 27 rank-and-file regular employees and members of the union on the ground of redundancy due to the seeding out of its selling and distribution system to the market execution partners. The termination of their employment was made effective on June 30, 2009, but the union members were no longer required to report for work as they were put on leave of absence with pay until the effectivity date of termination. The union members were also granted their individual separation packages which many of them accepted, but under protest. The union asserted that the new selling and distribution system adopted and implemented by the employer would result in the diminution of the union membership amounting to union busting into a violation of the collective bargaining agreement provision against contracting out services or outsourcing of regular positions. Thus, they filed a notice of strike with the National Conciliation and Mediation Board on June 3, 2009 on the ground of unfair labor practice, among others. On June 11, 2009, the union conducted a strike vote where the majority decided on conducting a strike. On June 23, 2009, the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment assumed jurisdiction over the labor dispute by certifying for compulsory arbitration to the National Labor Relations Commission the issues raised in the notice of strike. The Secretary also enjoined the parties from committing any act that may further exacerbate the situation. At this point, the union asserted that the employer should have enjoined the termination of employment which took effect on July 1, 2009. On the other hand, the employer contended that the termination of employment was a certainty from the time it issued the notices of termination and that the issuance of the assumption order included the impending termination of the employment of the 27 employees. On March 16, 2010, the National Labor Relations Commission ruled that the employer implemented a valid redundancy program and that it did not commit unfair labor practice. The Commission further found no violation in the dismissal of the employees from employment because their respective notices of dismissal were received prior to the assumption order of the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment. The Commission found that the employer did not commit any act that exacerbated the dispute. The Court of Appeals affirmed the decision of the National Labor Relations Commission. The Supreme Court, in turn, affirmed the validity of the employer's redundancy program. One issue that reached the Supreme Court was whether the employer's implementation of the redundancy program was an unfair labor practice. The other issue resolved by the court was whether the employer should have enjoined the effectivity of the termination of the employment of the 27 affected union members when the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment assumed jurisdiction over their labor dispute. The court reiterated prevailing jurisprudence in that unfair labor practice refers to acts that violate the workers' right to organize. The court stated that there should be no dispute that all the prohibited acts constituting unfair labor practice, in essence, relate to the worker's right to self-organization. Thus, an employer may only be held liable for unfair labor practice if it can be shown that his acts affect in whatever manner the right of his employees to self-organize. To prove the existence of unfair labor practice, substantial evidence has to be presented. In the present case, the court found that the union failed to substantiate its charge of unfair labor practice against the employer. According to the court, the consequent termination of employment due to redundancy is not per se an act of unfair labor practice amounting to union busting. For while the number of union membership was diminished due to the termination of the employment of union members, it cannot safely be said that the employer acted in bad faith in terminating their services because the termination was not without a valid reason. There was no showing that the redundancy program was motivated by ill will, bad faith, or malice, or that it was conceived for the purpose of interfering with the employee's right to self-organize.
The findings of the National Labor Relations Commission and the Court of Appeals on said issue were affirmed. However, the court found that the employer violated the return to work order in that the status quo was not maintained after the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment had assumed jurisdiction over the dispute on June 23, 2009. In this regard, the court relied on Article 263G of the Labor Code of the Philippines, which provides the conditions for and the effects of the assumption of jurisdiction by the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment over a dispute. The court explained that the powers given to the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment under Article 263G is an exercise of police power with the aim of promoting public good. In fact, the scope of the powers is limited to an industry indispensable to the national interest as determined by the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment. Industries that are indispensable to the national interest are those essential industries such as the generation or distribution of energy or those undertaken by banks, hospitals, or export-oriented industries. And following Article 263G, the effects of the assumption of jurisdiction are the following. Number one, the enjoining of an impending strike or lockout or its lifting. And number two, an order for the workers to return to work immediately and for the employer to readmit all workers under the same terms and conditions prevailing before the strike or lockout or the return to work order. The court added that when the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment exercises these powers, he is granted great breadth of discretion in order to find a solution to a labor dispute. The most obvious of these powers is the automatic enjoining of an impending strike or lockout or the lifting thereof if one has already taken place. Assumption of jurisdiction over a labor dispute, whereas in this case, the certification of the same to the National Labor Relations Commission for compulsory arbitration always coexists with an order for workers to return to work immediately and for workers to readmit all workers under the same terms and conditions prevailing before the strike or lockout. The court then highlighted the significance of the return to work order, which is interlocutory and is merely meant to maintain the status quo while the main issue is being threshed out in the proper forum. The court stressed that the status quo is simply the status of the employment of the employees the day before the occurrence of the strike or lockout. According to the court, from the date the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment assumes jurisdiction over a dispute until its resolution, the parties have the obligation to maintain the status quo while the main issue is being threshed out in the proper forum, which could be with the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment or with the National Labor Relations Commission. This is to avoid any disruption to the economy and to the industry of the employer, as this is the potential effect of a strike or lockout in an industry indispensable to the national interest while the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment or the National Labor Relations Commission is resolving the dispute. In the present case, the court found that since the union voted for the conduct of a strike on June 11, 2009, when the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment issued the return to work order dated June 23, 2009, this meant that the status quo was the employment status of the employees on June 10, 2009. This status quo should have been maintained until the National Labor Relations Commission resolved the dispute in its resolution dated March 16, 2010. For the court, the said resolution then took the place of the return to work order of the Secretary of the Department of Labor and Employment and the employer no longer had the duty to maintain the status quo after March 16, 2010. The court accordingly awarded to the employees back wages and other benefits from July 1, 2009 until March 16, 2010 with a recomputation of their separation pay taking into consideration the termination of their employment beginning March 16, 2010.